On the morning of June 16th, General Grant went to the Petersburg front. He was accompanied by most of his staff and by Mr. Dana, Assistant Secretary of War. The enemy was then constantly arriving and occupying his entrenchments in strong force. Burnside's corps had just come up and was put in position on Hancock's left. At 10.15 a.m., Grant sent an order to Meade to hurry Warren forward and start up the river himself by steamer to take command in person at Petersburg. The enemy's entrenchments which protected Petersburg were well located and were in some places strong. They started at a point on the south bank of the Appomattox, about a mile from the eastern outskirts of the city, and extended in the form of a semicircle to a point on the river at about the same distance from the western limits of the city. Petersburg had at that time a population of $18,000 and was called the Cockade City, from the fact that at the breaking out of the War of 1812, it furnished a company which was peculiarly uniformed and in which each man wore in his hat a conspicuous cockade. The probability of Lee's attacking Bermuda Hundred in force induced General Grant to return to City Point to direct the movements on Butler's lines. While riding in that direction, he met Meade hurrying forward from the steamer landing. In a short interview, and without dismounting from his horse, he instructed that officer to move at once to the front and make a vigorous attack upon the works at Petersburg at six o'clock in the evening and drive the enemy, if possible, across the Appomattox. It was discovered before that hour that the enemy was advancing upon Butler's front, and General Grant directed me to ride at full speed to Meade and tell him that this made it still more important that his attack should be a vigorous one, and that the enemy might be found weaker there on account of troops having been collected at Bermuda Hundred. I found Meade standing near the edge of a piece of woods, surrounded by some of his staff and actively engaged in superintending the attack which was then in progress. His usual nervous energy was displayed in the intensity of his manner and the rapid and animated style of his conversation. He assured me that no additional orders could be given which could add to the vigor of the attack. He was acting with great earnestness and doing his utmost to carry out the instructions which he had received. He had arrived at the front about two o'clock, and his plans had been as well matured as possible for the movement. Three reddens, as well as a line of earthworks connecting them, were captured. The enemy felt the loss keenly and made several desperate attempts during the night to recover the ground but in this he did not succeed. When I got back to City Point that evening, General Grant felt considerably encouraged by the news brought him and spent most of the night in planning movements for the next day. After further consultation with the General-in-Chief, I started again for the front at Petersburg before dawn on the 17th, carrying instructions looking to the contemplated attacks that day. Burnside's troops surprised the enemy at daybreak by making a sudden rush upon his works captured his entrenchments, swept his line for a mile, and took six hundred prisoners, a stand of colors, four guns, and fifteen hundred stands of small arms. Attacks were also made by Hancock and Warren, and more of the enemy's line was captured, but not permanently held. Telegrams sent by General Lee on June 17th show how completely mystified he was, even at that late day, in regard to Grant's movements. At 12 p.m., he sent a dispatch to Beauregard, saying, Until I can get more definite information of Grant's movements, I do not think it prudent to draw more troops to this side of the river. At 1.45 p.m., he telegraphed, Warren's Corps crossed the Chickahominy at Longbridge on the 13th. That night, it marched to Westover. Some prisoners were taken from it on the 14th, have not heard of it since. At 4.30 p.m., he sent Beauregard another dispatch, saying, have no information of Grant's crossing the James River, but upon your report have ordered troops up to Chaffin's Bluff. Grant, on the contrary, had ascertained from watchers on Butler's tall signal tower, which had been erected at Bermuda Hundred, just how many railway trains with troops had passed toward Petersburg, and learned from the columns of dust that large forces were marching south. From scouts, prisoners, and refugees he had secured each day a close knowledge of Lee's movements. Colonel Parker, the Indian, had been diligently employed in these busy days helping to take care of General Grant's correspondence. He wrote an excellent hand, 
and as one of the military secretaries often overhauled the general's correspondence and prepared answers to his private letters. This evening he was seated at the writing table in the general's tent, while his chief was standing at a little distance outside talking with some of the staff. A citizen who had come to City Point in the employ of the Sanitary Commission and who had been at Cairo when the general took command there in 1861, approached the group and inquired, Where is the old man's tent? I'd like to get a look at him. Haven't seen him for three years. Rawlins, to avoid being interrupted, said, That's his tent, at the same time pointing to it. The man stepped over to the tent, looked in, and saw the swarthy features of Parker as he sat in the general's chair. The visitor seemed a little puzzled, and as he walked away was heard to remark, Yes, that's him, but he's got all fired sunburnt since I last had a look at him. The general was greatly amused by the incident and repeated the remark afterward to Parker, who enjoyed it as much as the others. At daylight on the 18th, Meade's troops advanced to the assault which had been ordered, but made the discovery that the enemy's line of the day before had been abandoned. By the time new formations could be made, Lee's army had arrived in large force, great activity had been displayed in strengthening the fortifications, and the difficulties of the attacking party had been greatly increased. The Second Corps was temporarily commanded by D. B. Burney, as Hancock's Gettysburg wound had broken out afresh the day before, entirely disabling him. Gallant assaults were repeatedly made by Burnside, Warren, and Burney, and while they did not succeed in the object of carrying the enemy's main line of fortifications, positions were gained closer to his works, and these were held and strongly entrenched. Both of the opposing lines on this part of the ground were now strengthened and remained substantially the same in position from that time until the capture of Petersburg. General Grant realized the nature of the ground and the circumstances that prevented the troops from accomplishing more than had been done, and he complimented Meade upon the promptness and vigor with which he had handled his army on this day of active operations. Indeed, Meade had shown brilliant qualities as commander of a large army, and under the general directions given him had made all the dispositions and issued all the detailed orders. Grant felt it necessary to remain at City Point in order to be in communication with both Mia Day and Butler, as Lee's troops were that day moving rapidly south past Butler's front. My duties kept me on Meade's front a large part of the day. He showed himself the personification of earnest, vigorous action in rousing his subordinate commanders to superior exertions. Even his fits of anger and his resort to intemperate language stood him at times in good stead in spurring on everyone on that active field. He sent ringing dispatches to all points of the line and paced up and down upon the field in his nervous, restless manner as he watched the progress of the operations and made running comments on the actions of his subordinates. His aquiline nose and piercing eyes gave him something of the eagle's look and added to the interest of his personality. He had much to try him upon this occasion, and if he was severe in his reprimands and showed faults of temper, he certainly displayed no faults as a commander. When the battle was over, no one was more ready to make amends for the instances in which he felt that he might have done injustice to his subordinates. He said to them, Sorry to hear you cannot carry the works. Get the best line you can and be prepared to hold it. I suppose you cannot make any more attacks, and I feel satisfied all has been done that can be done. Lee himself did not arrive at Petersburg until noon that day. After I had returned to headquarters that evening and had given the general-in-chief reports of the battle in more detail than he had received them by dispatches during the day, he sat in his tent and discussed the situation philosophically, saying, Lee's whole army has now arrived, and the topography of the country about Petersburg has been well taken advantage of by the enemy in the location of strong works. I will make no more assaults on that portion of the line, but will give the men a rest, and then look to extensions toward our left, with a view to destroying Lee's communications on the south and confining him to a close siege. At ten o'clock he turned to his table and wrote the following message to Meade. I am perfectly satisfied that all has been done that could be done, and that the assaults of today were called for by all the appearances and information that could be obtained.
Now we will rest the men and use the spade for their protection until a new vein can be struck. It was apparent in the recent engagements that the men had not attacked with the same vigor that they had displayed in the wilderness campaign. But this was owing more to the change in their physical than in their moral condition. They had moved incessantly both day and night, and had been engaged in skirmishing or in giving battle from the 4th of May to the 18th of June. They had seen their veteran comrades fall on every side, and their places filled by inexperienced recruits, and many of the officers in whom they had unshaken confidence had been killed or wounded. Officers had been in the saddle day and night, securing snatches of sleep for a few hours at a time as best they could. Sleeping on horseback had become an art, and experienced riders had learned to brace themselves in their saddles, rest their hands on the pommel, and catch many a catnap while riding. These snatches of sleep were of short duration and accomplished under many difficulties, but often proved more refreshing than might be supposed. There was considerable suffering from sickness in many of the camps. It may be said that the enemy had suffered equally from the same causes that impaired the efficiency of our men, but there was a vast difference between the conditions of the two armies. The enemy had been engaged principally in defending strong entrenchments and in making short marches. He was accustomed to the southern climate and was buoyed up with the feeling that he was defending his home and fireside. A controversy had arisen as to the cause of Hancock's not reaching Petersburg earlier on the 15th. Hancock conceived the idea that the circumstances might be construed as a reproach upon him, and he asked for an official investigation. But General Grant had no intention of reflecting either upon him or Meade. He assured them that, in his judgment, no investigation was necessary. He recommended them both for promotion to the grade of major general in the regular army, and each was appointed to that rank. The headquarters camp at City Point was destined to become historic and to be the scene of some of the most memorable events of the war. It was located at the junction of the James and the Appomattox Rivers, and was within easy water communication with Fort Monroe and Washington, as well as with Butler's army, which was to occupy positions on both sides of the Upper James. The City Point Railroad was repaired, and a branch was constructed to points south of Petersburg, immediately in rear of the line held by the Army of the Potomac, so that there might be convenient communication with that army. The new portion of the road was built, like most of our military railroads, upon the natural surface of the ground, with but little attempt at grading. It ran uphill and down dale, and its undulations were so marked that a train moving along it looked in the distance like a fly crawling over a corrugated washboard. At City Point there was a level piece of ground on a high bluff on which stood a comfortable house. This building was assigned to the chief quartermaster, and General Grant's headquarters camp was established on the lawn. The tents occupied a line a little over a hundred feet back from the edge of the bluff. In the middle of the line were General Grant's quarters. A hospital tent was used as his office, while a smaller tent connecting in the rear was occupied as his sleeping apartment. A hospital tent, Fly, was stretched in front of the office tent so as to make a shaded space in which persons could sit. A rustic bench and a number of folding camp chairs with backs were placed there, and it was beneath this tent fly that most of the important official interviews were held. When great secrecy was to be observed, the parties would retire to the office tent. On both sides of the general's quarters were pitched close together enough officers' tents to accommodate the staff. Each tent was occupied by two officers. The mess tent was pitched in the rear, and at a short distance still farther back a temporary shelter was prepared for the horses. A wooden staircase was built reaching from headquarters to the steamboat landing at the foot of the bluff. Ample wharves, storehouses, and hospitals were rapidly constructed, and a commodious base of supplies was established in the vicinity. The day the wharf was completed and planked over the general took a stroll along it, his hands thrust in his trousers' pockets and a lighted cigar in his mouth. He had recently issued instructions to take every precaution against fire, and had not gone far when a sentinel called out. It's against orders to come on the wharf with a lighted cigar. The general at once took his Havana out of his mouth and threw it into the river, saying, I don't like to lose my smoke, but the sentinel's right. <laughs>
he evidently isn't going to let me disobey my own orders. Each staff officer took his turn in acting as catterer of the mess, usually for a month at a time. His duties consisted in giving general directions to the steward as to ordering the meals, keeping an account of the bills, and at the end of his tour dividing up the expenses and collecting the amount charged to each officer. General Grant insisted upon paying two shares of the expenses instead of one, upon the ground that he invited more guests to meals than anyone else in the mess, although this was not always the case, for each officer was allowed to entertain guests, and there were at times as many visitors at table as members of the mess. The officer acting as caterer sat at the head of the mess table, with the general on his right. It now came my turn to take a hand in managing the affairs of the mess. The general, while he never complained, was still the most difficult person to cater for in the whole army. About the only meat he enjoyed was beef, and this he could not eat unless it was so thoroughly well done that no appearance of blood could be seen. If blood appeared in any meat which came on the table, the sight of it seemed entirely to destroy his appetite. This was the man whose enemies delighted in calling him a butcher. He enjoyed oysters and fruit, but these could not be procured on an active campaign. He never ate mutton when he could obtain anything else and fowl and game he abhorred. As he used to express it, I never could eat anything that goes on two legs. Evidently he could never have been converted to cannibalism. He did not miss much by declining to eat the chickens which were picked up on a campaign, for they were usually tough enough to create the suspicion that they had been hatched from hard-boiled eggs and were so impenetrable that an officer said of one of them that he could not even stick his fork through the gravy. The general was fonder of cucumbers than of anything else, and often made his entire meal upon a sliced cucumber and a cup of coffee. He always enjoyed corn, pork and beans, and buckwheat cakes. In fact, he seemed to be particularly fond of only the most indigestible dishes. He had been eating so little for several days just before I took my turn as caterer that I looked about to try to find some delicacy that would tempt his appetite, and after a good deal of pains succeeded in getting some sweetbread sent down from Washington. They had been nicely cooked, and I announced them, when they came on the table, with an air of ill-disguised triumph. But he said, I hope these were not obtained especially for me, for I have a singular aversion to them. In my young days I used to eat them, not knowing exactly what part of the animal they came from, but as soon as I learned what they were, my stomach rebelled against them, and I have never tasted them since. When any fruit could be procured, it was placed on the table by way of helping to ornament it, and afterward used as dessert. Between the courses of the dinner the general would often reach over to the dish of fruit and pick out a berry or a cherry and eat it slowly. He used to do this in a sly way, like a child helping itself to some forbidden dish at the table and afraid of being caught in the act. He said one day, I suppose I ought not to eat a course out of its turn, but I take the greatest delight in picking out bits of fruit and eating them during a meal. One of the reasons I do not enjoy dining out as much as I do at home is because I am compelled to sit through a long list of courses, few of which I eat, and to resist the constant temptation to taste a little fruit in the meanwhile to help pass away the time. Napoleon was famous for eating out of the various dishes before him with his fingers. General Grant's use of the fingers never went beyond picking out small fruits. He was always refined in his manners at table, and no matter how great was the hurry or what were the circumstances of the occasion, he never violated the requirements of true politeness. He ate less than any man in the army. Sometimes the amount of food taken did not seem enough to keep a bird alive, and his meals were frugal enough to satisfy the tastes of the most avowed anchorite. It so happened that no one in the mess had any inclination to drink wine or spirits at meals, and none was carried among the mess's supplies. The only beverage ever used at table besides tea and coffee was water, although on the march it was often taken from places which rendered it not the most palatable or healthful of drinks. If a staff officer wanted anything stronger, he would carry some commissary whiskey in a canteen. Upon a few occasions, after a hard day's ride in stormy weather,
the general joined the officers of the staff in taking a whiskey toddy in the evening. He never offered liquor of any kind to visitors at headquarters. His hospitality consisted in inviting them to meals and to smoke cigars. Chapter 15 Lincoln's first visit to Grant's camp. Lincoln at the front. Some anecdotes by Lincoln. Movement against the Weldon Railroad swapping horses. Sheridan returns, where Pocahontas saved John Smith. General James H. Wilson's raid. The staff enlarged. On June 21st, Butler had thrown a pontoon bridge across the James and seized a position on the north side known as Deep Bottom, ten miles below Richmond. General Grant had directed this with a view to divide the attention of the enemy's troops and to confuse them as to whether to expect an attack upon Richmond or Petersburg, and because he had in contemplation some operations on the north side of the James, which he intended to carry out under certain contingencies, in which case the occupation of Deep Bottom might become important. On Tuesday, June 21st, a White River steamer arrived at the wharf, bringing President Lincoln, who had embraced this opportunity to visit for the first time, the armies under General Grant's immediate command. As the boat neared the shore, the general and several of us who were with him at the time walked down to the wharf in order that the general-in-chief might meet his distinguished visitor and extend a greeting to him as soon as the boat made the landing. As our party stepped aboard, the president came down from the upper deck where he had been standing to the after gangway, and reaching out his long, angular arm, he wrung General Grant's hand vigorously and held it in his for some time, while he uttered in rapid words his congratulations and expressions of appreciation of the great task which had been accomplished since he and the general had parted in Washington. The group then went into the after cabin. General Grant said, I hope you are very well, Mr. President. Yes, I am in very good health, Mr. Lincoln replied, but I don't feel very comfortable after my trip last night on the bay. It was rough and I was considerably shaken up. My stomach has not yet entirely recovered from the effects. An officer of the party now saw that an opportunity had arisen to make this scene the supreme moment of his life, in giving him a chance to soothe the digestive organs of the chief magistrate of the nation, he said, Try a glass of champagne, Mr. President. That is always a certain cure for seasickness. Mr. Lincoln looked at him for a moment, his face lighting up with a smile, and then remarked, No, my friend, I have seen too many fellows seasick ashore from drinking that very stuff. This was a knockdown for the officer and in the laugh at his expense Mr. Lincoln and the general both joined heartily. General Grant now said, I know it would be a great satisfaction for the troops to have an opportunity of seeing you, Mr. President, and I am sure your presence among them would have a very gratifying effect. I can furnish you a good horse, and will be most happy to escort you to points of interest along the line. Mr. Lincoln replied, Why, yes. I had fully intended to go out and take a look at the brave fellows who have fought their way down to Petersburg in this wonderful campaign, and I am ready to start at any time. General Grant presented to Mr. Lincoln the officers of the staff who were present, and he had for each one a cordial greeting and a pleasant word. There was a kindliness in his tone and a hearty manner of expression which went far to captivate all who met him. The President soon stepped ashore and after sitting a while at headquarters mounted the large bay horse Cincinnati, while the general rode with him on Jeff Davis. Three of us of the staff accompanied them, and the scenes encountered in visiting both Butler's and Meade's commands were most interesting. Mr. Lincoln wore a very high black silk hat and black trousers and frock coat. Like most men who had been brought up in the West, he had good command of a horse, but it must be acknowledged that in appearance he was not a very dashing rider. On this occasion, by the time he had reached the troops, he was completely covered with dust, and the black color of his clothes had changed to Confederate gray. As he had no straps, his trousers gradually worked up above his ankles and gave him the appearance of a country farmer riding into town wearing his Sunday clothes. A citizen on horseback is always an odd sight in the midst of a uniformed army and the picture presented by the president bordered upon the grotesque. However, the troops were so lost in admiration of the man that the humorous aspect did not seem to strike them. 
the soldiers rapidly passed the word along the line that Uncle Abe had joined them, and cheers broke forth from all the commands, and enthusiastic shouts and even words of familiar greeting met him on all sides. After a while, General Grant said, Mr. President, let us ride on and see the colored troops who behaved so handsomely in Smith's attack on the works in front of Petersburg last week. Oh, yes, replied Mr. Lincoln. I want to take a look at those boys. I read with the greatest delight the account given in Mr. Dana's dispatch to the Secretary of War of how gallantly they behaved. He said they took six out of the sixteen guns captured that day. I was opposed on nearly every side when I first favored the raising of colored regiments, but they have proved their efficiency, and I am glad they have kept pace with the white troops in the recent assaults. When we wanted every able-bodied man who could be spared to go to the front, and my opposers kept objecting to the Negroes, I used to tell them that at such times it was just as well to be a little color-blind. I think, General, we can say of the black boys what a country fellow who was an old-time abolitionist in Illinois said when he went to a theater in Chicago and saw Forrest playing Othello. He was not very well up in Shakespeare and didn't know that the tragedian was a white man who had blacked up for the purpose. After the play was over, the folks who had invited him to go to the show wanted to know what he thought of the actors, and he said, Wow! laying aside all sectional prejudices and any partiality I may have for the race, durned if I don't think the nigger held his own with any on him. The Western dialect employed in this story was perfect. The camp of the colored troops of the 18th Corps was soon reached, and a scene now occurred which defies description. They beheld for the first time the liberator of their race, the man who by a stroke of his pen had struck the shackles from the limbs of their fellow bondmen and proclaimed liberty to the enslaved. Always impressionable, the enthusiasm of the blacks now knew no limits. They cheered, laughed, cried, sang hymns of praise, and shouted in their Negro dialect, God bress massa lincum, de Lord save fader Abraham, de day ob jubilee am cum shua. They crowded about him and fondled his horse. Some of them kissed his hands, while others ran off crying in triumph to their comrades that they had touched his clothes. The president rode with bared head, the tears had started to his eyes, and his voice was so broken by emotion that he could scarcely articulate the words of thanks and congratulation which he tried to speak to the humble and devoted men through whose ranks he rode. The scene was affecting in the extreme, and no one could have witnessed it unmoved. In the evening, Mr. Lincoln gathered with General Grant and the staff in front of the general's tent, and then we had an opportunity of appreciating his charm as a talker and hearing some of the stories for which he had become celebrated. He did not tell a story merely for the sake of the anecdote, but to point a moral or to clench a fact. So far as our experience went, his anecdotes possessed the true geometric requisite of excellence. They were neither too broad nor too long. He seemed to recollect every incident in his experience and to weave it into material for his stories. One evening, a sentinel whose post was near enough to enable him to catch most of the president's remarks was heard to say, Well, that man's got a powerful memory and a mighty poor forgettery. He seldom indulged even in a smile until he reached the climax of a humorous narration. Then he joined heartily with the listeners in the laugh which followed. He usually sat on a low camp chair and wound his legs around each other as if in an effort to get them out of the way, and with his long arms he accompanied what he said with all sorts of odd gestures. An officer once made the remark that he would rather have a single photograph of one of Mr. Lincoln's jokes than own the negative of any other man's. In the course of the conversation that evening, he spoke of the improvement in arms and ammunition and of the new powder prepared for the fifteen-inch guns. He said he had never seen the latter article, but he understood it differed very much from any other powder that had ever been used. I told him that I happened to have in my tent a specimen which had been sent to headquarters as a curiosity, and that I would bring it to him. When I returned with a grain of the powder about the size of a walnut, he took it, turned it over in his hand, and after examining it carefully said, Well, 
It's rather larger than the powder we used to buy in my shooting days. It reminds me of what occurred once in a country meeting house in Sangamon County. You see, there were very few newspapers then, and the country storekeepers had to resort to some other means of advertising their wares. If, for instance, the preacher happened to be late in coming to a prayer meeting of an evening, the shopkeepers would often put in the time while the people were waiting by notifying them of any new arrival of an attractive line of goods. One evening a man rose up and said, Brethren, let me take occasion to say, while we're a-waitin', that I have just received a new invice of sportin' powder. The grains are so small, you can scarcely see them with the naked eye, and polished up so fine you can stand up and comb your hair in front of one of them grains just like it was a lookin' glass. Hope you'll come down to my store at the crossroads and examine that powder for yourselves. When he had got about this far, a rival powder merchant in the meeting, who had been boiling over with indignation at the amount of advertising the opposition powder was getting, jumped up and cried out, Brethren, I hope you'll not believe a single word Brother Jones has been saying about that powder. I've been down there and seen it for myself, and I pledge you my word that the grains is bigger than the lumps in a coal pile. And any one of you, brethren, if you was in your future state, could put a barla of that powder on your shoulder and march square through the sulfurous flames surrounding you without the least danger of an explosion. We thought that grain of powder had served even a better purpose in drawing out this story than it could ever serve in being fired from a fifteen-inch gun. As the party broke up for the night, I walked into my quarters to put back the grain of powder, and upon turning round to come out, I found that the president had followed me and was looking into my tent from curiosity, doubtless, to see how the officers were quartered. Of course I made haste to invite him in. He stepped inside for a moment, and his eye fell upon a specimen artillery trace, a patented article which some inventor had left the day before in order to have it examined at headquarters. The president exclaimed, Why, what's that? I replied. That is a trace. Oh, remarked Mr. Lincoln, that recalls what the poet wrote. Sorrow had fled but left her traces there. What became of the rest of the harness he didn't mention. That night Mr. Lincoln slept aboard the boat which had brought him to City Point. He had expressed to General Grant a desire to go up the James the next day to see that portion of our lines and visit the flagship of Admiral Lee who commanded the gunboats. All arrangements were made for the trip and the President's boat started up the river about eight o'clock the next morning, stopping at Bermuda Hundred to take on General Butler. Admiral Lee came aboard from his flagship, and the party proceeded up the river as far as it was safe to ascend. Mr. Lincoln was in excellent spirits, and listened with great eagerness to the descriptions of the works, which could be seen from the river, and the objects for which they had been constructed. When his attention was called to some particularly strong positions which had been seized and fortified, he remarked to Butler, When Grant once gets possession of a place, he holds on to it as if he had inherited it. Orders had been sent to have the pontoon bridge at Deep Bottom opened for the passage of the President's boat, so that he could proceed some distance beyond that point. His whole conversation during his visit showed the deep anxiety he felt and the weight of responsibility which was resting upon him. His face would light up for a time while telling an anecdote illustrating a subject under discussion, and afterward his features would relax and show the deep lines which had been graven upon them by the mental strain to which he had been subjected for nearly four years. The National Republican Convention had renominated him for the presidency just two weeks before, and some reference was made to it and to the number of men who composed the Electoral College. He remarked, Among all our colleges, the Electoral College is the only one where they choose their own masters. He did not show any disposition to dwell upon the subject or upon the approaching political campaign. His mind seemed completely absorbed in the operations of the armies. Several times when contemplated battles were spoken of, he said, I cannot pretend to advise, but I do sincerely hope that all may be accomplished with as little bloodshed as possible. Soon after his return to City Point, the President started back to Washington.
His visit to the army had been a memorable event. General Grant and he had had so much delightful intercourse that they parted from each other with unfeigned regret, and both felt that their acquaintance had already reaped into a genuine friendship, General Grant having decided that it would be inexpedient to attempt to carry the works at Petersburg by assault, now began to take measures looking to the investment of that place by leaving a portion of his forces to defend our works, while he moved out with the other portion against the railroads, with the design of cutting off Lee's communications in that direction. Wright's entire corps had been sent back from Butler's front to the Army of the Potomac, and Martindale's command had been returned to Butler, so that Meade's and Butler's armies were again complete. Meade's corps were disposed as follows, from right to left of the line. Burnside, Warren, Burney, Hancock's, Wright. On the morning of June 22nd, Wright's and Burney's corps moved westward with a view to crossing the Weldon Railroad and swinging around to the left, but they were vigorously attacked and forced back some distance. They advanced again in the evening, but nothing important was gained. On June 23rd, Burney and Wright again moved out. There was great difficulty in preserving the alignment of the troops, as they had to pass through dense woods and almost impenetrable thickets, which made the movement a slow and difficult process. About four o'clock in the afternoon, while a portion of Wright's troops were at work destroying the Weldon Railroad, a large force of the enemy struck his left and drove it back. Darkness soon came on, and nothing of importance was accomplished. Wright was now given authority to withdraw his corps to the position occupied the night before, which was more advantageous. Meade had sent frequent messages to Grant, who was this day at Bermuda Hundred, keeping him advised of the movements in his front, and that night he telegraphed, I think you had better come up here tomorrow if convenient. General Grant felt considerably annoyed about the operations that day at Petersburg and regarded the position of the Army of the Potomac as somewhat vulnerable. In extending to the left, the center had been depleted while the left flank was out in the air and would consequently be weak if a heavy and determined attack should be made upon it. The enemy had made his entrenchments so strong that he could afford to move a large portion of his force to his right for the purpose of such an attack. Hancock was much missed from the command of the Second Corps. It was quite natural that Meade should ask Grant to come in person to the lines in front of Petersburg, and it was another indication of the confidence which his subordinate commanders reposed in him. At eight o'clock on the morning of June 24th, the general rode to the headquarters of the Army of the Potomac, accompanied by Rawlins, myself, and two others of the staff. In discussing with Meade and some of the corps commanders the events of the two previous days, he gave particular instructions for operations on that part of the line. The guns of the siege train which he had ordered now began to arrive from Washington. Meade was told that they would be sent to him immediately, and it was decided to spend the next few days in putting the guns and mortars into commanding positions, in the meanwhile permitting the troops to desist from active operations. The heat was now intense, and the men were in much need of rest. Meade gave Grant and his staff a comfortable lunch, and late in the afternoon our party started for City Point. Owing to the heat and dust, the long ride was exceedingly uncomfortable. My best horse had been hurt, and I was mounted on a bay cob that had a trot which necessitated no end of saddle pounding on the part of the rider, and if distances are to be measured by the amount of fatigue endured, this exertion added many miles to the trip. The general was riding his black pony, Jeff Davis. This smooth little pacer shuffled along at a gait which was too fast for a walk and not fast enough for a gallop, so that all the other horses had to move at a brisk trot to keep up with him. When we were about five miles from headquarters, the general said to me in a joking way, You don't look comfortable on that horse. Now I feel about as fresh as when we started out. I replied, it makes all the difference in the world, General. What kind of horse one rides? He remarked, Oh, all horses are pretty much alike, as far as the comfort of their gait is concerned. In the present instance, I answered, I don't think you would like to swap with me, General. He said at once, Why, yes, I'd just as lief swap with you as not. <laughs>
and threw himself off his pony and mounted my uncomfortable beast while I put myself astride of Jeff. The general had always been a famous rider, even when a cadet at West Point. When he rode or drove a strange horse, not many minutes elapsed before he and the animal seemed to understand each other perfectly. In my experience, I have never seen a better rider, or one who had a more steady seat, no matter what sort of horse he rode. But on this occasion, it soon became evident that his body and that of the animal were not always in touch, and he saw that all the party were considerably amused at the jogging to which he was subjected. In the meantime, Jeff Davis was pacing along with a smoothness which made me feel as if I were seated in a rocking chair. When we reached headquarters, the general dismounted in a manner which showed that he was pretty stiff from the ride. As he touched the ground, he turned and said with a quizzical look, Well, I must acknowledge that animal is pretty rough. Sheridan had arrived on June 20th at White House on his return from the expedition to the north side of the North Anna River, upon which he had been sent on the 7th. As soon as Lee learned of Hunter's success, he sent Breckinridge's troops to oppose him, and hearing that Sheridan had started, he ordered Hampton's and Fitzhugh Lee's cavalry commands to move against our cavalry. They were to attack Sheridan during the night of the 10th and surprise him, but that officer was not to be caught napping. He advanced promptly toward Trevilian's station, and in a well-conceived and brilliantly executed battle, defeated the Confederate cavalry and then effectually destroyed several miles of the Virginia Central Railroad. He now obtained information from the prisoners he had captured that Hunter was in the vicinity of Lynchburg and not likely to reach Charlottesville, and as the enemy had thrown a large force of infantry and cavalry between Hunter and him, and as he was encumbered with a large number of prisoners and wounded, and his supply of ammunition was nearly exhausted, he felt that it would be useless to try to make a junction with Hunter and decided to return to the Army of the Potomac by way of White House, where ample and much-needed supplies were awaiting him. On his arrival, orders were given that this depot should be broken up on the 20 seguided, and the train of 900 wagons which had been left there was crossed to the south side of the James River, having been gallantly and successfully defended on its way by Sheridan's cavalry. On the 26th, Sheridan came in person to Grant's headquarters, and had an interview with him in regard to the results of his expedition and the further operations which he was expected to undertake at once on the south side of Petersburg. Sheridan was cordially greeted on his arrival by the general-in-chief. He was at all times a welcome visitor at headquarters, as his boundless enthusiasm, buoyant spirits, and cheery conversation were always refreshing. The general, after learning all the details of Sheridan's expedition, told him that he fully approved his judgment in not attempting, under the contingencies which had arisen, to reach Hunter. But as usual, the general did not dwell at length upon the past, and promptly began the discussion of the plans he had in view for the cavalry in the future. A day or two afterward Grant paid a visit to Butler's lines, and while he and the staff were riding out to the front, they came to the place where, according to tradition, Pocahontas had saved the life of Captain John Smith. Whether it was the exact spot or not, it was regarded in that locality as historic ground, and Virginians, who take a particular pride in well-known family names, seemed to honor Pocahontas especially, no doubt because she was largely instrumental in preserving the Smith family to posterity. In the efforts to account for the attempted execution of the prisoner, there is a story told about the truth of which there is a lingering uncertainty. It is to the effect that, when the captain fell into the hands of the Indian chief, he was rash enough to state, in reply to questions as to his identity, that his name was John Smith, and that the noble red man thought he was trying to perpetrate a practical joke on him, and was roused to swift vengeance by such an ill-timed pleasantry. In climbing a rather steep hill at this point, the party had to move along a narrow bridle path. The general was riding in the lead, followed by the staff in single file, with Badeau bringing up the rear. The trees were soon found to be so near together that a horse and rider could not pass between them when keeping in the path, and we turned out to the left, where the woods were more open. Badeau's nearsightedness prevented him from seeing very far ahead, 
and he was not paying much attention to his horse, but simply letting him go along as he pleased. Suddenly we heard a cry from him, I'm going off, I say I'm going off. On looking round, we found his horse climbing up the path with a tree on each side, between which he could scarcely squeeze. When Badeau's knees reached the trees, his saddle was forced back, and as the horse struggled on, his rider finally slid off over the animal's tail. Then came the cry, See here, I'm off! And Badeau and the saddle were seen lying on the ground. The horse stepped out of the girth and quietly continued his march up the hill as if nothing had happened. General Grant stopped, and looking back at the ludicrous sight presented, fairly screamed with laughter and did not recover his equanimity during the remainder of the ride. Nothing could have been more amusing to him than such an accident, for as he was an exceptionally expert horseman, awkwardness on the part of a rider was more laughable to him than to most people. Badeau, with the assistance of an orderly, had his horse re-saddled, and, mounting again, soon joined the cavalcade. General Grant cracked jokes at his expense all the rest of the ride, and for two or three days afterward, when he would be sitting quietly in front of his tent, he would suddenly begin to shake with laughter and say, I can't help thinking how that horse succeeded in sneaking out from under Badeau at Bermuda Hundred, while the enemy's cavalry was north of the James, and the probabilities were that it would be detained there by Sheridan for some days, it was decided to send Wilson's Division of Cavalry, which had remained with the Army of the Potomac, and four regiments of the cavalry of the Army of the James under Coutts to the south of Petersburg, with a view to striking both the south side and the Danville railroads. This cavalry command started out on the morning of June 22nd. It was composed of nearly 6,000 men and several batteries of horse artillery. It first struck the Weldon, then the South Side Railroad, and afterward advanced as far as Roanoke Station on the Danville Road, inflicting much damage. On the 29th, after severe fighting, it found itself confronted and partly surrounded by such a heavy force of the enemy that there was no means of cutting a way through with success, and it was decided to issue all the remaining ammunition, destroy the wagons and caissons, and fall back to the Union lines. The troops were hard-pressed by greatly superior numbers and suffered severely upon their march, but by untiring energy and great gallantry, succeeded in reaching the Army of the Potomac on July 1st. The expedition had been absent ten days. It had marched three hundred miles and destroyed a large quantity of rolling stock and about fifty miles of railroad. The loss in killed, wounded, and missing amounted to about fifteen hundred men. All the guns and wagons were destroyed or abandoned. The cavalry supposed that the infantry of the Army of the Potomac would be in possession of Reams's station at the time of their return. But that station was still in the hands of the enemy. The destruction of communications by Hunter, Sheridan, and Wilson gave the enemy serious alarm. But by dint of great effort, he in time made the necessary repairs and was again able to bring supplies to Richmond by rail. In the meantime, the siege of Petersburg had begun, and it was now Grant's intention to make the investment as complete as possible and to take advantage of every opportunity to inflict damage on the enemy and give him battle whenever he could do so under circumstances that would be justifiable. On June 29, Grant felt anxious about the fate of the cavalry and the progress of Wright's corps, which had been sent to Reams's station to Wilson's relief but did not reach there in time. He rode out to the Petersburg front with his staff, held interviews with Meade, Burnside, and Smith, and visited the lines to make a personal inspection of the principal batteries. He became impressed with the idea that more field artillery could be used to advantage at several points, and when we returned to headquarters that evening, he telegraphed to Washington for five or six additional batteries. From the 4th of May until the end of June, there had not been a day in which there was not a battle or a skirmish. The record of continuous and desperate fighting had far surpassed any campaign in modern or ancient military history. In view of the important operations which were to be conducted from City Point, General Grant made some changes in the organization of the staff. General Rufus Ingalls, who had distinguished himself by the exhibition of signal ability as chief quartermaster of the Army of the Potomac,
was assigned to duty as chief quartermaster upon the staff of the general-in-chief. Grant and he had been classmates at West Point and were on terms of extreme intimacy. Ingalls was exceedingly popular in the Army, and both officially and personally was regarded as an important acquisition to the staff. Lieutenant Colonel M. R. Morgan, an efficient and experienced officer of the commissary department, was added to the staff of the General-in-Chief as Chief Commissary, thirty years after he became Commissary General of the Army, soon after General M. R. Patrick was made Provost Marshal General and General George H. Sharpa was assigned to duty as his assistant. The latter officer rendered invaluable service in obtaining information regarding the enemy by his employment of scouts and his skill in examining prisoners and refugees. Captain Amos Webster was placed on duty as assistant quartermaster. Assistant Surgeon E. D. W. Brenneman, LTSA, was assigned to look after the health of those at headquarters, but the particularly robust condition of nearly all the officers he was prepared to attend made his work exceedingly light. In discussing at this time the large amount of rations which had to be supplied by the subsistence department and the system required in its management, General Grant said, When I first had an independent command, there were so few experienced men about me that I had to sit down at night and teach officers of the staff departments how to make requisitions for supplies and fill out the blank forms furnished by the government when such blanks could be procured. I had acted at times as quartermaster and commissary in the old army, and was of course familiar with all the forms used in preparing papers. Word was brought to me one day that a new regimental commissary had gone aboard a commissary boat on the Mississippi and presented a requisition for rations for his men. The officer in charge looked at it in amazement and exclaimed, Why, there are not half enough rations aboard this entire steamer to fill that requisition. The commissary, who thought he had made only an ordinary demand, said, Why, you're filling requisitions for all the other regiments in our brigade. Regiment, cried the commissary, you mean a corps. The regimental commissary then discovered that he had made out his requisition on a corps blank. A hospital had been established at City Point large enough to accommodate 6,000 patients and served a very useful purpose. The general manifested a deep interest in this hospital, frequently visited it, and constantly received verbal reports from the surgeons in charge as to the care and comfort of the wounded. A telegraph line had been established on the south side of the James, which connected by cable across Hampton Roads with Fort Monroe. From that place there was direct telegraphic communication with Washington. This line was occasionally broken, but by dint of great effort, it was generally well maintained and made to perform excellent service. The general headquarters had become an intensely interesting spot. Direct communication was kept open as far as possible with the various armies throughout the country, all of which the general-in-chief was directing, and information of an exciting nature was constantly received and important orders were issued. The officers on duty had an opportunity to watch the great war drama from behind the scenes, from which point they witnessed not only the performance of the actors, but the workings of the mastermind that gave the directions and guided all the preparations. Chapter 15 A Disappointed Bandmaster, Hunter's Raid Early's Raid on Washington, Grant as a writer, Grant, devotes attention to Sherman, Grant's treat, meant of his generals, Grant's equanimity, Grant as a thinker, why Grant never swore, Meade and Warren, Seward visits, Grant. Earthworks had been thrown across the neck of land upon which City Point is located. This entrenched line ran from a point on the James to a point on the Appomattox River. A small garrison had been detailed for its defense, and the commanding officer, wishing to do something that would afford the general-in-chief special delight, arranged to send the band over to the headquarters camp to play for him while he was dining. The garrison commander was in blissful ignorance of the fact that to the general the appreciation of music was a lacking sense, and the musicians score a sealed book. About the third evening after the band had begun its performances, the general, while sitting at the mess table, remarked, I've noticed that that band always begins its noise just about the time I am sitting down to dinner and want to talk. 
I offered to go and make an effort to suppress it and see whether it would obey an order to cease firing, and my services were promptly accepted. The men were gorgeously uniformed, and the band seemed to embrace every sort of brass instrument ever invented, from a diminutive cornet of pistons to a gigantic double bass horn. The performer who played the latter instrument was encaged within its ample twists and looked like a man standing inside the coils of a whiskey still. The broad-belted bandmaster was puffing with all the vigor of a quack medicine advertisement. His eyes were riveted upon the music, and it was not an easy task to attract his attention. Like a sperm whale, he had come up to blow and was not going to be put down till he had finished. But finally he was made to understand that, like the hand organ man, he was desired to move on. With a look of disinheritance on his countenance, he at last marched off his band to its camp. On my return, the general said, I fear that bandmaster's feelings have been hurt, but I didn't want him to be wasting his time upon a person who has no ear for music. A staff officer remarked, Well, general, you were at least much more considerate than Commodore, who, the day he came to take command of his vessel and was seated at dinner in the cabin, heard music on deck and immediately sent for the executive officer and said to him, Have the instruments and men of that band thrown overboard at once. Hunter's bold march and destruction of military stores had caused so much alarm that Lee, as has been said before, was compelled to send Breckinridge's force and Early's corps to the Valley of Virginia. Hunter continued to drive back the troops he encountered till he reached Lynchburg. There he found that the strength of the works and the combined forces brought against him would prevent the further success of his raid. On June 18th, he decided to exercise the discretion which had been left to him in such a contingency and retire toward his base. The result of the campaign, besides compelling Lee to detach troops from his own army, was the burning of Confederate cloth mills, gunstock and harness factories, and foundries engaged in the manufacture of ammunition, the destruction of about fifty miles of railroad, and the capture of three thousand muskets, twenty pieces of artillery, and a quantity of ammunition. The stringent orders given by Grant to Siegel and by him turned over to Hunter, who had succeeded him, were prepared with a view to preventing all wanton destruction. They were in part as follows. Indiscriminate marauding should be avoided. Nothing should be taken not absolutely necessary for the troops, except when captured from an armed enemy. Impressments should be made under orders from the commanding officer and by a dispersing officer. Receipts should be given for all property taken, so that the loyal may collect pay and the property be accounted for. Notwithstanding these orders, there were some houses burned and damage done to individual property during this raid. Hunter, having been compelled to fall back into West Virginia, the roads to Washington were left uncovered, and the enemy now advanced into Maryland. Siegel's small force retreated precipitately across the Potomac, followed by the enemy. It had been impossible for General Grant to obtain any reliable news for a number of days in regard to these movements, and it was not until the 4th of July that he received definite information. We did not find many leisure moments to indulge in patriotic demonstrations at headquarters on Independence Day, for the directions for executing the plans for checkmating the enemy in his present movement fully occupied everyone on duty. Grant telegraphed to Halleck to concentrate all the troops about Washington, Baltimore, Cumberland, and Harper's Ferry, bring up Hunter's troops, and put Early to flight. While Grant was thinking only of punishing Early, there was great consternation in Washington, and the minds of the officials there seemed to be occupied solely with measures for defending the capital. Hunter's troops had fallen back to Charleston, West Virginia, and a drought had left so little water in the Ohio River that the ascent of the vessels on which his troops had embarked was greatly delayed.